All right, Matthew chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 23 through 27. In a message I'm entitling, The King in the Storms of Life. But we could just as easily have entitled this message, Stay Calm in the Storm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your love. And Heavenly Father, we pray that for that person, that man, that woman who finds himself, herself in a profound state of agitation, of difficulty, struggling with fear, Lord, we pray that you would speak to hearts this morning. Lord, we pray that you would remind us by your Holy Spirit that perfect love casts out fear. And Lord, again, I pray for that person troubled in a dark place, in a difficult place. Lord, I pray that by your love and by your spirit, you will bring a profound sense of peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 23. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We're perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. So the men marveled saying, who can this be? that even the winds and the sea obey him. Matthew records a series of miracles beginning in chapter 8. It goes through chapter 10. It was in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 35 promised that in the kingdom of the Messiah, that kingdom would see the blind eyes opened and the lame walk and Jesus has healed leprosy in verses 1 through 4, palsy in verses 5 through 13, a fever in verses 14 through 17. But now Jesus is going to reveal his power not only over disease and not only over demons, but even over nature itself. Jesus has left the crowds to take leave with his disciples. And some in the crowd wanted to see more miracles. They remained curious about Jesus' identity and whether or not this might be the Messiah. Some Bible teachers suggest that the storm that day was perhaps satanic in origin in an attempt to prematurely kill Jesus or ruin God's plans, the ferocity of the storm and the fear in these seasoned fishermen caused some to wonder, is the storm itself supernatural? But whatever the truth is, we understand that Jesus is going to produce peace. He is going to produce peace in the center of the lake because he's in the center of God's will. Jesus remains calm. It's the kind of calm that no matter how terrifying the storm, that there is a profound sense of peace. And as you look at the passage, you'll see something that it begins with a promise and it continues with his presence, but it ends with power. The Lord Jesus can calm the sea. The terrified disciples go from a great tempest in verse 24 to a great calm in verse 26 and they have this great storm and a great calm because they have a great savior. How about you? 
Have violent storms produced great fear in your life? You know, almost all of us are either coming upon a storm or we are in the storm or we have just left the storm. Is your life marked by fear or by calm? You know, one of the things that we know that if you have the promises of Jesus in your life and the presence of Jesus in your life and the power of Jesus in your life, you have the ability to face the storm. I think people everywhere want happiness. But I think what they really want is peace. Peace with God. Peace in their world. Is it possible to have peace with God? And we know we've repeatedly said that we live in a broken world, but we also live in a redeemed world. And the world remains filled with phobias and fears. You know, it's interesting, during World War II, a military governor met with General George Patton in Sicily my father and my grandfather and grandmother and my aunts and uncles were all in Sicily at this time. And when the governor praised Patton highly for his courage and bravery, the general replied, Sir, I'm not a brave man. He said, The truth is, I'm a craven coward. Patton said, I've never been within the sound of a gunshot or in the sight of a battle in my whole life that I wasn't so scared that I had sweat on the palm of my hands. Years later, when he wrote his autobiography, he wrote this significant statement. He said, quote, I learned very early in my life never to take counsel from my fears. There's things that are informing your thinking. Either your courage or your fear. Who will you listen to? And who will you listen to in the furious storm? A few fearful sailors in desperation are going to awaken a faithful savior in verses 25 and 26. And watch how quickly the storm becomes an ocean of calm waters, much to the amazement of the astonished disciples. Look at verse 23 again. Following the king into the storm, it says in verse 23, now when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the geography of that area or the Sea of Galilee, it's to the north in that region called the Galilee. It's about a, it's a body of water about 13 miles long and it's between six and seven miles wide. And we believe that in antiquity, it was probably a little bit larger because much of the water is, is siphoned off, but the body of water is about 680 feet below sea level. And north of the Galilee is this beautiful mountain. It's called Hermon, or Mount Hermon. And it rises 9,280 feet, and that might not seem very tall, particularly for those of us who live here in Colorado, but you've got to remember that it starts off about 600 feet below sea level, and so it juts straight up. And in the winter, the mountain is sometimes covered with snow. You can see it in this picture. Cold air will descend from Mount Herman, and then continue through a small ravine in the northern part of the valley. And there's a funnel, and the funnel opens up, and it lands right on the Sea of Galilee. And that spells storms. Sudden storms are not uncommon, and waves have been known to get as high as 25 feet. Question. Does Jesus know that the storm is coming? Yeah, he does. Jesus knows that the storm is coming. Does Jesus have the ability to stop the storm even before it begins? The answer is yes. 
But it should cause you to ask that question about yourself, huh? Lord, why do you allow the storm? You could make sure that it doesn't happen. Why do you permit the storms in my life? Why do you permit some hardship and some difficulty and some setback? And perhaps one of the reasons might be the reason that we find even in this passage in verse 27. When you come to the end of the passage, it says, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? In the storm, something is going to happen. There's going to be a revelation concerning the nature of Jesus and who he is exactly. As a matter of fact, remember in verse 18, if you look back in the passage, it says, and when Jesus saw great multitudes about him in verse 18, he gave a command to depart to go to the other side. You see, this isn't just any ordinary storm. This is a storm that Jesus has commanded the disciples to go into. And that makes it even more difficult, particularly when the Lord said to you, stay with your husband, stay with your wife, stay on the job, and you go, but the wind is blowing and the storm is raging. The disciples weren't in disobedience. They were in obedience. They weren't in the wrong place. They were in the right place. So why would Jesus command them and then lead them into a storm? And I think that the answer is in part, minimum, so that we can learn to love him and to trust him. And believe him. You see, the storms of our life reveal things not only about ourselves, but about our Lord. Clearly, the storm will strengthen the belief of Jesus' followers, strengthen the belief of his personal care, of his real concern. The kind of care and concern that can deliver you from the violent storms of life, the fearful trials, the fearful experiences, because the fearful experiences are going to come. But also, there's the hope of assurance. In verse 24, look what it says. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. By the way, this is the only passage in the New Testament that refers to Jesus sleeping. The word It says, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea. That word tempest or storm is the Greek noun seismos. You know that word, don't you? We get the word seismic from it or like a seismograph. It's a word that's like, well, earthquake words. This, is, this means something violent. This means something that literally shakes. And so when it says, so the boat was covered with the waves, means that the waves were so high that the boat was hidden from view. Imagine you're on the sea and the waves are rearing up so much so that you lose sight of the boat even from the shore. It wouldn't take long for a full-scale disaster to hit. And that's exactly what fearful experiences are sometimes like, aren't they? I think that fearful experiences fall into two categories. Those that you can see that are very clear and very evident. But then there's another kind of fearful experience. It's the kind that nobody sees, that nobody is aware of. It's the kind of things that happen in your life that not everyone is privy to. Some things are visible. Some things are invisible to the naked eye. But in the text, look what it says. But he was asleep. And it's, again, okay to ask the question, why was he asleep? Well, the most obvious answer is 
That's right, he's tired. Those of you who've been following along in the text, remember that he's gotten up very early. He's been to the synagogue. He's been healing people and casting out demons and then delivering Peter's mother-in-law. It's been a long, long, long day. But it also speaks to something else. His humanity. Jesus is a real human being. With all of the pain and the central nervous system and the limitations of a human being, in his humanity, he grows weary. In his humanity, he gets tired. In his humanity, he may grow weary and he may get tired, but his confidence is in the plan of God and the mission of God and the will of God. The storm, by the way, is mentioned first in the text. Look what it says again in verse 24. Suddenly the great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat is covered with waves, but he's asleep. And again, it begs the question, how do you stay asleep in that violent storm? How can he not hear the crashing waves? How can he not feel the roller coaster ride as the boat lifts and falls and all of the disciples' stomachs are heaving with panic, freaking out with all of the difficulty? Can't he hear the oars? Can't he smell the fear? Can't he hear their groans as they scream, we're all gonna die? Why isn't that sufficient to wake him? I know what you're thinking. Just like in my life, just like in my life. How is it possible that it feels like he's asleep in this thing called the boat of my life. You might be going through a difficult storm right at this very moment. And you're wondering, has Jesus fallen asleep? How could he not know what the doctor said? How could he not know what my husband or my wife said? How could he not know about the difficulties that I'm facing? Have you ever cried out, where are you? Where are you, Jesus? Relax. Jesus isn't worried. And Jesus isn't agitated. Jesus isn't pacing in heaven, freaking out, wringing his hand, going, I know I created the heavens and the earth, but what am I going to do about this? He doesn't get scared. He doesn't get alarmed. He never falls into a panic. He's always in control. And some people have the strange notion, they have the strange notion that if I don't feel the presence of Jesus, he's not there. And I want you to think about the text that you're reading because even though Jesus is there, they know he is present, but apparently he isn't conscious in such a way that he should be able to offer insight into their situation. One of the great central themes of the story of Jesus is his presence and you'll remember what the Bible says in the New Testament remember what he said I will be with you I'll never leave you I'll always be with you sometimes you sense his presence profoundly sometimes you don't sense his presence but God has the ability to see us and protect us and preserve us in the storm I have another hard question. It's really not that hard. Everybody's going to get it right. Are the disciples and Jesus going to die that day? Are they going to die someday? I think that that's the right answer, yeah. The Bible says it's appointed once for a human being to die. And then the judgment. The truth is... Each and every one of us face profound difficulties and circumstances. And one of two things is going to happen. We're going to be delivered 
in the storm or we're going to be delivered through the storm. But make no mistake about it, Jesus is going to effect a final deliverance for each and every one of us. People are gripped by fear. They worry about their job. They worry about their health. They worry about their future. What is it that frightens you? Is it the winds of change? Is it political incompetence? Is it the lightning of disaster? Is it the thunder of a crashing economy? Is it the implosion of our country? Is it the zombie apocalypse? You would think that that's what our culture is terrified of if you just do a quick survey of everything that's on TV. It's all about a post-apocalyptic world where somehow we've managed to survive no matter what it is that seems to be crushing us. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. There is a peace and a trust that's available for the person whose heart and mind is fixed on the Lord Jesus. And look what it says, trusting the king in the storm. In verse 25, it says, then his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We're perishing. In, God, in Mark's gospel, chapter four, verse 35, we read, Jesus at the beginning of crossing over says, let us cross over to the other side. Chuck Smith was fond of saying, Jesus said, cross over, not under. I like that. The reason why I like it is because the moment that Jesus gives a promise, you can be sure that he's going to keep the promise. We can trust Jesus when he gives us a promise. And he's given us promises. I've already alluded to one. Remember, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will be with you. I will find you. I will walk with you. It's interesting to me. Peter, almost certainly in the boat, will later write in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. He has given us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in this world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. The truth is God has given us promises. The issue isn't whether or not you've been given a promise. The issue becomes, what will you do with the promise? What will you do with the promise that Jesus has given to you? And by the way, the disciples' prayer is short. And let's be blunt. Do you think sincere? Let's read it again. Lord, save us. We're perishing. Amen. <laughs> I'm thinking it's fairly sincere. Question. Are they afraid? Yeah, I think that that's the right answer. They're seized with a fear that seems beyond their control. For some of you, that seems so foreign. It seems so distant. You've never experienced fear like that. But others know exactly about that fear. You know exactly what it means to be seized with a fear that seems beyond your control, that no matter how much you pray and no matter how many Bible verses you read, no matter how much you try to get away from the fear, the fear remains. And I'm going to suggest to you that when they say we are perishing, what they're saying is we think we're going to die. And in a disaster, we need a Lord and not necessarily a teacher. The disciples aren't looking for intellectual insight on the nature of 
storms and tidal waves. They, they don't want to lecture about how big the waves are. They don't want to lecture about, do you realize that once your, your lungs fill with water, then that's when the oxygen is replaced and you drown and you die. That's not what they want to hear. It isn't a, a speech about natural disasters. We can make the choice to live next door to a volcano. But is there a place on the earth, is there anywhere on the planet absent tornadoes, absent hurricanes, absent earthquakes, absent electric storms? Is there some place, is there any place on the earth where you can live risk-free, problem-free, no danger from anywhere or anyone? I don't think so. But can you pick a spot where the waves are really, really high and the boat is really, really small? Well, that's on you. But I'm going to suggest to you that even if the waves are very, very high and even if the boat is very, very small, the most important thing is Who's in this boat with you? Who's riding with you? You know, I want to say a few words about fear. There was a French existentialist who said that each century can be summed up in a single word. He wrote, if I were to take the 17th century, he used the word mathematics. 18th century, he used the, the term natural sciences. In the 19th century, he put biology. And for the 20th century, he wrote the single word Fear. He died before the 20th century came to an end. But I wonder what he might have written for the 21st century. What would you offer? Technology? Maybe more fear? Or what if you could pick a word because guess what? It is now 2015 and the 21st century still has a long way to go. Wouldn't it be great if we could find a word and make that word real for this century? Like the word faith. Or the word revival. Can you imagine if this became the century of faith? Can you imagine if this became the century of revival where people looked away from their sin and they looked away from the difficulty and they looked towards the reality of what it means to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ? I read somewhere where a wife's number one fear is that she's going to be abandoned. I read that a husband's number one fear is failure. What's the thing that grips you? What's the thing that causes you to stay awake at night or follows you in your dreams? Have you ever been so afraid that you thought that you might die? Or have you ever been so afraid because someone you love so much might die. We are all in the same boat. We're all subject to the same storms. And sometimes we want to abandon ship and bail out. But if it's true, if there's one thing true about the storm, and if there's one thing true about fear in the storm, it's that the that the storm intensifies our fears, magnifies them, and, and then gets them all out of proportion. There was a crusty old sea captain who used to use some pretty colorful language, and he was also an outspoken atheist. And one night in a storm, he was washed overboard, and his men heard him crying out to God for help. And when he was finally rescued, one of the men said, I thought you didn't believe in God. The old captain said, well, if there isn't a God, there ought to be for times like this. <laughs> and it's interesting, isn't it? For people who don't believe the Bible and they don't believe in Jesus. 
It would be great if it were true. And I'm going to suggest to you that it is true. In the storm, sometimes people are willing to ask and question their deeply held convictions. What do I really believe? What do I believe about this world? What do I believe about the world's problem? What do I believe about the condition of the world? No matter who you are, no matter what you believe, whether you're an atheist or an agnostic, whether you would self-identify as a Buddhist or a Hindu or, or a Muslim, wh whatever it is and however you would self-describe, if you were asked the question, what is the problem? What is the problem in this world? People of all stripes, people of all colors, people of all convictions will, will say that there's, su there's suffering and there's pain and there's difficulty in this world. Fear intensifies the storm, but fear can also bring paralysis. Fear always involves loss. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, the, John the apostle will write, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. The Bible says that the opposite of fear is love. You know, what's interesting is fear always involves loss. If you were to take fear and if you were to put it in some sort of spiritual oven and you were to boil it down to its fundamental essence, it would be loss. That's what fear is. I could lose my life. I could lose my job. I could lose my family. I could lose my future. I could lose. I could lose. I could lose. That's the essence of fear. But you know what's interesting? It's also the essence of love. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that he's willing to lay down his life for a friend. So what is the difference? What is the difference between fear and love? The difference is one is voluntary and the other one is involuntary. You see, when you're afraid, you don't want to be. You want to be involved in the process of making the decision of whether or not I'm willing to lose this. And the solution to fear is love. I'm not talking about sentiment. That means emotion without commitment. I'm talking about the biblical definition and the biblical view of love. Love that has its origin in God. Love that's modeled in Jesus. The love that's spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The kind of love that looks for opportunities to give. Fear always looks with suspicion and wonders what he or she might do to them. But love thinks no evil. Fear thinks of nothing but evil. Love labors in the daily task, but fear puts off because it's paralyzed. Love is willing to give, but fear, fear seeks to protect itself. Love moves towards others. Fear means you move away from others. Remember, love casts out fear, so love has this expulsive power. Love and faith has the ability to push the fear away. A woman who's fearful of a bug or a rodent or a snake will go up against a bear in order to save her children. Remember, what would cause a woman with a broomstick to fight an eight-foot bear? It's because the love of her children becomes greater than her fear of the bear. Love produces boldness. Loving God expels fear. And the more we love, the less we fear. And by the way, we never find Jesus afraid of anything or anyone. No wonder Jesus will say throughout the New Testament, fear not, don't be afraid, 
Don't be afraid. He does it without hypocrisy. And some fears, though, are rooted in reality. Robert, not his real name, believed he was being followed all the time. Robert was a drug counselor. And you might think, well, that's not such a bad thing. But he was also a drug counselor turned drug dealer. Oh, that might be a problem. Yeah, if you are a drug counselor who becomes a drug dealer, then you live a double life. And people who live a double life often are afraid of getting caught in that double life. I think fear falls into two kinds of categories, reasonable and unreasonable. There's a healthy fear and an appropriate fear. If you see a rattlesnake and you hear it rattling, maybe the good thing is to go in the different direction. There's a healthy fear. In verse 26, look what it says. But he said to them, why are you fearful? Oh, you have little faith. Matthew Henry offers this excellent insight. He writes, He does not chide them for disturbing him with their prayers, but before disturbing themselves with their fears. I like that. The expression, oh, you of little faith is used here, and it's used some five other times in the Greek New Testament. In chapter 6, verse 30, he uses the expression. Right here in chapter 8, in chapter 14, verse 31, again in chapter 16, verse 8, again in Luke's gospel in chapter 12, verse 28. Is Jesus upset because of their lack of faith? I'm going to suggest to you that he's not upset. When he asks the question, why are you fearful? Remember what we've already seen. He's healed the leper. He's healed the centurion servant. He's healed many others. He's cast out demons. One Bible teacher says, haven't you seen enough of my power and experience? Experienced enough of my love to know that you're perfectly safe with me, unquote. And I love that. The reason why I love that, because of the rub. If we say it out loud, it sounds shocking. But let's say it out loud. Am I safe? With Jesus. Am I safe with Jesus? I want you to think about the question, but I also want you to think about the circumstances of the text that you're reading right at this very moment. Jesus asks the question Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Not before the storm. And not even after the storm, but during the storm. During the storm. That's when he's asking the question, am I safe with Jesus? Think about their answer at that point. Jesus, remember what you just said, why are you fearful? Savior, I'll look around. Look at the 25-foot waves. Uh, We are 600 feet below sea level. Um, There's about 300 more feet to the bottom of this lake. Uh, Jesus, why are we fearful? Have you forgotten how deep the water is? Have you forgotten how far it is to shore? Jesus, do you really expect us to have faith in the storm? And I think that the answer is yes. And that's the point of the question. Is it reasonable for Jesus to say, hey, check out these waves. Hey, check out how far it is to the shore. We get that, Jesus, we get that. What's the solution to fear? What's fear's antidote? Jesus says it in the statement. Why are you fearful, 
Oh, you of little faith. It isn't going to take much faith, Jesus basically says. And by the way, faith helps us cope with our fears. And remember, for those of you who have been following along in our study in the book of Hebrews where the theme is faith, remember in Hebrews chapter 11, faith is the evidence of things unseen. Faith isn't just some sort of magic that you generate inside of your heart. Faith is confidence in God. Faith is believing Jesus' promises. Faith helps us cope with our fears. Faith is trusting the Lord. Faith is trusting the Lord Jesus. And when we have problems beyond our powers, we need a power beyond our problem. That makes sense to you. You should tweet that, by the way. When we have problems beyond our powers, we need a power beyond our problems. We need the power of God and the presence of a living Savior. And Jesus will use three basic things in his earthly ministry. Miracles, teaching, and training. But do you know what the miracles and the teaching and the training all have in common? They have the net effect of building our faith and bring us, bringing us to a place where we will have confidence in the God who we know and the one that we love. And so look again in verse 26 at the end of the verse. It says, then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. In the earlier verse, in verse 20, Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have nests. The son of man has no place to lay his head. The homeless king has absolute authority over the wind and the waves. Think of the contrast. This Jesus, who doesn't have a home, commands the winds and the sea. And the reality is he stills the storms of our lives. And that's the point of the passage. In Mark's gospel, chapter 4, verse 39, Mark translates this or says, peace, be still. One, one translation goes, hush, be quiet. Jesus speaks to the weather like it's a wayward child. Shh, just calm down, relax. And the wind ceased. Jesus says, peace, be still. And the waves become like glass. And the crisis is passed as quickly as it comes. The storm was preceded by a promise. Let us cross over to the other side. The storm included the presence of Jesus. They took him with them. And then the manifestation of power he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. It becomes a type and a picture of your own life and your own heart. You have his promise. You have his presence. Jesus would say, all authority, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And remember, he said, I'm going to always be with you. Is there a great storm in your life? But even in that great storm, is there a great calm? Calm is a wonderful word, and I know it's come back into fashion, hasn't it? Everybody likes that word again. The word means motionless, still. But it carries with it the idea of composure, self possession. It carries with it the idea, are you okay? Do you have your wits about you? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm going to be good. God's in control. Not just some sort of Christian cliche, not just some sort of bumper sticker, superficial statement. No, Jesus has given me his promise. No, I'm walking in his presence. I'm experiencing his power. What brings calm? The absence of the storm? The innocence of the heart? I think it's confidence in God. 
Faith fights fear. Faith fights fear and brings calm. Do you doubt the divine wisdom? Do you doubt his power? Do you doubt his love? Is Jesus on the boat that you call your life? What's interesting is petition and prayer brings calm. What have you told Jesus about the storm? You know, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, it says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved in quietness and confidence. That shall be your strength. And then it says these sad words, but you would not. And you said, no, for we will flee on horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. In the passage, return and rest or run away. Return and rest or run away. In verse 27 it says, So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Does it surprise you that the creator, the creator, the creator of the universe has power over his creation? The universe is subject to God. There's not a single renegade molecule anywhere in the universe. The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus sustains the world by the word of his power in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth that are visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all all things were created through him and for him. The Bible teaches Jesus has control over everything, including the storms that blow into your life. In Psalm 89, 8, it says, O Lord God of hosts, who is like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Isn't it interesting? In Psalm 89 verses 8 and 9 when it says, the Lord Jehovah God of hosts causes the waves to stand still. And here in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus causes the waves to stand still. Who is he? Who could he possibly be? Is he the sovereign Lord? Is he Israel's Messiah? Does his power and care extend to you? You know, there are two kinds of people, I think, Italian people and those who wish they were. No, those aren't the two again. <laughs> those who are woefully ignorant of Jesus and willfully ignorant of Jesus. Woefully and willfully ignorant. I want you to just ask that question just for a moment. It's okay even to ask your family and your friends, who do you think he is? Who is he? What am I supposed to think about him? What am I supposed to think about his true nature and his true mission? Most of you know the passage of scripture that says that there's going to come a time when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is and they'll do it on this side of eternity or they'll do it on the other side of eternity. But there will come a time when no one, no one, no one, no one is either woefully or willfully ignorant of his true nature. So what have we learned? Storms come. Even when we follow Jesus in obedience. 
What have we learned? Things happen. And we don't have any control over it. What have we learned? That the disciples cry in fear and panic for Jesus to save them. And I'm going to suggest to you it's an okay prayer. It's okay to pray that prayer. Lord, my life is falling apart. The boat sprung a leak. Save me. What have we learned? That sometimes fear itself is so powerful that it takes a hold of us and we wonder how we can ever get rid of it. But we know that faith and love will expel fear. What have we learned? We have resources in the storm. Jesus is with us, no matter how fierce the storm, no matter how frightening the experience, Jesus invites us to exchange our fear for faith and to trust him. We have his promise. We have his presence. He'll give us his power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your love. Lord, thank you even for the storms. We pray that we would learn the lessons that will know you better, that will see you clearer, that will trust you with more confidence. And Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the promises that you've given to us in Christ. Thank you for his presence in our life because we've experienced forgiveness of sin. And thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in confidence and hope. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.